Thanks for joining us, and welcome to the Beyond Sunday podcast. You are watching the Beyond Sunday podcast. Our goal is not to declare a right or wrong view, but to explore differing views held by sincere believers that are followers of Christ. As believers, we have to agree on the essentials of faith, but on the peripherals, our hope is that we will have grace and freedom as we seek God together. Through these discussions, we hope to show multiple sides of an issue so that we actually can grow in our own personal understanding and see why someone else might believe the way that they do, Mm -hmm. to bring unity to the church no matter where we, we may worship. Today, we want to look at two different views about Scripture, in this case, the views of infant and believer baptism. Yeah, this is going to be juicy. So, (laughs) I bet. When is the most appropriate time to be baptized? All right, good question. Are the parents supposed to do this at infancy as to keep your child safe from the reality of hell, or does that even count? Or are you supposed to wait until... You personally can make that decision on your own Mm. and surrender your own life as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, there are two main different views that today we're going to look at, and we're going to dive in on this episode. This topic is pretty widely debated, and people tend to feel pretty strongly about what they believe on it, um, no matter what the direction is, but... We're going to get into it and try to accurately paint the pictures well from both perspectives so that you as the listener can better learn how you might feel about this particular topic. All right, so let's dive in. Um, Our first view is often called infant baptism. Now, this view is seen and practiced throughout church history. It's actually believed that early church writings referring to children as being born again to God, specifically, demonstrates support of infant baptism. Some early church writers mention the practice of infant baptism and speak of it as being traditional and customary. That means our earliest writings are reflecting back, saying that this was a practice. In Scripture, children have always been a part of God's covenant. In Genesis 17, 7, it says, God was making an everlasting covenant with Abraham and his offspring. In Joshua 8.35, it mentions the commandments are read before all the little ones. Now, these passages assume that the covenant included children in in that covenant language as well. Mm -hmm. Now, supporters for this view also take the words uh, from Jesus in Mark 10 uh, about the kingdom of God belonging to the children and his blessing over them as confirmation of, of child baptism there. Got it. Even though they did not understand all that was occurring around them, meaning the kids, Jesus still blessed the kids that were there with him. And again, in Acts 2, uh, the promise of the Holy Spirit is for believers and their children again. So it's the Holy Spirit's for kids. Supporters would argue that the baptism of the children would be received so they could receive the Holy Spirit, which is a promise given to them as well. Additionally, the Apostle Paul's words to the church in Corinth provide support for the view of infant baptism. In 1 Corinthians, he explains that through believing parents, the child is holy. Mm. The child doesn't stand alone. The individualistic approach is really part of our Western culture. Uh, That's for us. That wasn't part of the early church. Paul would have viewed the child as part of the greater family and the covenant for the parents was theirs as well. Therefore, they should be baptized. There are other examples in Acts of uh, family being baptized, which suggests that children may have been part of that instruction. The passages don't specifically mention young children, but supporters of the position would argue that there are no passages specifically restricting child baptism either. Finally, uh, this point considers the words of Paul in Colossians chapter 2. He speaks of a a spiritual circumcision. Since circumcision was part of the covenant, the Old Testament covenant, and that circumcision was performed when the child was eight days old, uh, 
shouldn't our spiritual circumcision, which is represented by baptism, be open to the same people at the same time of life? Yeah. So in the in the support of the infant um, baptism view, uh, one of the main supports of this view here is one of the things that uh, you actually mentioned okay. earlier, um, and it's church tradition. Right, that's fair. I mean, this has been practiced since at least the second century. Right. That's quite a while. Sure. And And the problem is, if this is a wrong view, then that would mean that there have been very few legitimate baptisms in the church hmm. over okay. the last 2,000 years, and surely that can't be right. Okay. Another support of the infant baptism view is the fact that this is God's initiative in salvation. Mm-hmm. When baptism is only for the adult who can comprehend, at least in part, the reality of this choice, then that gives us the impression to think that salvation is just a matter of God responding to our human decision. Hmm. Okay. And they would argue that an infant baptism is a much more beautiful illustration of God working in the lives of those infants, even before they know who God actually is on a relational level. Now, flipping over to the other side, an objection to infant baptism is that the Bible contains no direct reference to the practice. However, even though it doesn't specifically mention it, supporters would say that it isn't specifically excluded either. Another argument is that Scripture says that baptism comes through faith. At Pentecost, Peter says to repent and be baptized. However, it should be considered that Peter was speaking to a group of adults. Mm -hmm. They would be the first generation of believers. As the church grows, though, shouldn't the new covenant flow to even the children of believers? That's a good question. Good thought. (laughs) (laughs) So the believer view um, would be that the believer view most certainly um, would say that the beginning practice— of infant baptisms was a mistake. Okay. Uh, When we surrender our lives to Jesus, we're saying yes to obeying to his commands Mm -hmm. and following him as one of his disciples. We can't possibly do this if we don't have a relationship in the first place. Okay. And so this view would say that baptism only came after there was a point of repentance, which a baby is not going to do. Fair enough. They don't repent very well when they're crying. (laughs) Not very well at all. So in Mark chapter 1, verse 5, it says, And all the country of Judea was going out to him, and all the people of Jerusalem. They were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Okay. The believer's baptism view would agree that in Acts chapter 2, Peter does indeed promise that the gift of the Holy Spirit is promised to adults. Mm Mm-hmm and children as well. Okay. Those who argue infant baptism like to use this as a basis for why it's important to baptize the children of believing parents. Okay. But this reads too deep into the text according to this view. Okay. Peter was saying that the promise is for them in the sense that God wants to pour out his spirit on them, but they become receivers of the promise only when they choose to make a personal decision to repent and Hmm. believe in Jesus Christ. Okay, fair point. And uh, throughout church history, supporters of this position would argue that infant baptism creates nominal believers. Without proper discipleship, faith does not develop in the child, and baptism is fruitless. Infant baptism can lend to a lack of urgency for the young person to begin their own personal faith journey for them to have that ability to repent. Yep. Whereas adult baptism encourages an individual to pursue a path of discipleship and make a decision to receive baptism as a believer. And I think that's a fair support. Yeah. So there's four main responses to the rebuttals against the believer's right. baptism view. Up. So the first one is that the infant baptism view holders would say that Scripture just opposes this view. Okay. They often point to the New Testament practice of household baptism, Mm -hmm. but the passages used for that argument don't require or even suggest that infants were baptized. Okay. Now, the second argument is that the believer's view ignores the continuity of the Old and New Covenants, the way that they work together. Okay. The covenant concept, admittedly by the believer's view— does connect the Old and New Testaments and the Abrahamic Covenant Mm -hmm. 
is fulfilled in the new covenant. Mm -hmm. However, they would argue that those who baptize infants have missed the decisive shift in the new covenant as it pertains to the fulfillment of Abraham's promise. All right. It's not a literal genetic connection anymore Hmm. that determines a child of Abraham, but it's the act of faith that makes you a descendant of Abraham. Okay. We see in Galatians chapter 3, verse 6 through 9, it talks about this Mm -hmm. specifically, and it says in the last verse that those who believe are blessed with Abraham who Who believed. believed. Right. The third argument against the believer's view is that it has been obviously influenced by Western individualism. In reply to that that argument, the believer's baptism view would say it's not shifted due to Western individualism, but it's because of the New Testament's concept and teaching of personal salvation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Each believer has to first choose to believe, and then they're baptized scripturally as the first act of obedience. Mm -hmm. And the final argument that you would hear is that it just goes against church tradition. And we talked about this uh, a couple minutes ago. They would say there's no way that for over 2,000 years we've been baptizing infants and it doesn't count (laughs) because they didn't decide on their own. Okay. The believer's baptism view would simply say that we can't look to tradition to settle an issue like this. Yep. Scripture is our only authority as it pertains to matters of faith and practice. So Christians shouldn't set aside tradition-based perspectives. However, they can and must do so if the traditional view contradicts what Scripture teaches us on our particular faith practices. Fair enough. So there you have it. Two quick views and a a fairly short rundown on the subject. And we hope that this discussion has given you a look at a couple of views around this important ordinance of our faith. As we always say, the point isn't to declare a position, but to provide understanding around an area of doctrine where there's often division within the church. Hopefully, this has been helpful in providing more information on what we believe. See you next time, and we'll uh, enjoy another cup of coffee and another uh, look at an area of our faith. Take care. This has been another episode of the Beyond Sunday podcast. And don't forget, like, share, and subscribe.